Lynn. Hello. Ooh, Sarah Lynn, one of the top 10 finalists of the scholarship awards. That's going to be on Friday. Make sure, folks, we're doing the Flavor 360 Scholarship Friday People's Choice Awards. So you get to determine which one of them get the cash scholarships. Um, outstanding. We're going to wait just um, a couple minutes. It's only 12.01. <laughs> so I think it's fair enough to wait till maybe three after. That's okay with everyone. That's Feel fine. free to talk. We wanted to make sure this was uh, open for discussion. So uh, you can speak up if you'd like. It's been a great format so far. Right? Platform's been amazing. What, a, what an improvement from over the last year, how things have just evolved and Pathable's been really good. Well, they'll have it down pat when we all can see each other. <laughs> well, and great thing is we can do both. Right. That's, that's the wonderful thing. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's, it's enabled folks that couldn't afford the resources of any sort to, uh, to come to the, to the conference and now they can. Right at a, at a tenth the cost. Right. And Carol Willenbring, I haven't seen you for ages. Re, hello there, Mr. Chandra. Wow, this is quite a, ooh, this is quite a group. We better step up our game here. A lot of qualified <laughs> folks here. Precious <laughs> on. <laughs> okay, folks. Uh, thanks for joining. We've got what forty-four people already. Outstanding. And yes, feel free to use the chat. We've got Erin from uh, Smith Buckland is in the background, making sure everything runs well. She already um, did something that made a big difference for us. So we're gonna wait another, let's just say one more minute and then I'd say, let's just get into it because we've got a lot of things to share with you. Karina, how are you feeling? You ready? Yep, yep. Okay. Are we expecting a full house here? <laughs> Oh, it sure looks like it. Oh, Patty Mitchell, Lauren, Dan Goral. Oh my goodness. Wow. Outstanding. Okay, folks. Uh, Karina, I think I'm going to get started if you're good with that, okay? Yep, sure. Okay, outstanding. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us live today. And for um, hello to all those of you watching the video later on. Uh, today, it's my honor to be sharing some of our past, present, and future work. And with me today is the co-founder of Flavor360, uh, Ms. Karina Wong. Thank you, Robert, for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. So we shall start off with a short introduction and then follow up by the session objectives. So Robert, would you like to go ahead first? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and she's in Australia right now, it's 3 a.m., but she's dedicated <laughs> to the RCA, so she's in. We gotta uh, do this. <laughs> Okay, so let me just do a quick background. I know a lot of you, but some of we don't, I'm not fortunate to know all of you. So all of these different roles and opportunity have really provided me um, an opportunity to develop a unique set of skills to capture flavor experiences. And so after 35 years in F&B and the last 20 in R&D, uh, my, final, my final chapter is building this ultimate technology tool, Flavor360. And um, so at every stage of the innovation process, you can capture flavor experiences. But that's kind of who I am as a, as a person and as a professional. But um, yeah, Karina, I'm proud to introduce my partner in this. Thank you. So again, thank you for joining our session today. So um, as a graduate from the hospitality field, I started off working in the restaurant and tourism industry, playing different roles being a service staff, working in the kitchen, and also leading tours for food companies. So it really gave me the opportunity to understand the industry and transform myself into a more discipline, multidisciplinary professional. So with my interests and multicultural background, I have dedicated the past eight years in food and tourism studies. And currently, like Robert mentioned, I'm doing my postgraduate degree in food science in Australia. So I'm honored to have the opportunity today to share some of the interesting learnings um, on a project that we're working on uh, fermented bean paste via the lens of building lexicons and applying them in business wow. use cases. So let's get started. Let's do it. Okay, folks. So, so this is what we're going to begin with. And if folks, if you can go move back to solve this yeah. moment, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Or um, Aaron, you can just mute everyone. So let's begin with why this is a investment of your resources. And what we're going to do is I'll we're going to take um, lexicon to a whole new level with ontologies. And Karina, what say you? Well, I mean, okay, good. thank you. 
We'll see so building on. <laughs> All right, I will just keep going. So Please. building on what you are saying, Robert, uh, we would also elucidate on how we transform this different scientific method into a practical workflow. And then the body of knowledge that we generated will also be demonstrated in an interactive flavor model. Lastly, we will open the floor to questions or for the further discussion. Thank you. I'm going to see if I can mute everyone. Hopefully it doesn't mute, allow participants to unmute themselves. I'm going to go for this. There we go. Karina, I can still hear you if you unmute yourself. Okay, let's keep going here, folks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I want to be clear. There's well-established and published papers on the scientific process of developing a lexicon, which is an incredible tool for trained panels and sensory analysis. And on the Pathable platform, I posted several of these different papers will be going that you can take a review and then go buy the paper. And today, we're going to be going through a more realistic approach for small, medium, and large companies um, to do themselves. And most importantly, a workflow that you can use in your day-to-day -day business. So it's not just theory. So Karina, why do we even take this journey? Well, I mean, having a common language would definitely reduce a tons of you know, going back and forth, tons of emails, especially, I mean, during the pandemic, when face-to-face -face interaction is limited, we, we can see this burden coming up. So I'm gonna throw the question back to you, Robert. So as an expert in the field who have gone through hundreds, if not thousands of tasting of different sizes, what would you say is the biggest challenge if you need to pull together a consistent set of vocabularies to describe a product? Well, I mean, I think our, our, our role as R&D professionals is, is to interpret, right? Interpret qualitative flavor experiences into quantita quantifiable um, and scalable food and beverage products, right? And menu items. And we waste countless time explaining and re-explaining. And there's much more efficient ways of doing that to speed up the R&D process and uh, let alone sa save my time. So language, uh, Karina is one of your specialties. I think you're at five. You've worked in, you know, R and D in I think six countries. So, what's the risk of speaking different languages? Well, I mean, language is definitely always going to be a, a big struggle. Um, maybe let me tell you an example. So, I remember you, we used to have this big debate um, on this word "xianwei," which means in Chinese "umami," right? So, this word itself is. This, exactly or 100% or equivalent to umami flavor that we're referring to. Because in Chinese, we have specific descriptors for different type of umami flavors, depend on the type of product we're talking about here. For example, we, we have savory umami to describe umami flavor generated from fermented product. And then we have seafood umami flavor generated mm. from fresh seafood itself. So even if we're speaking the same language, depending on the cultural background we're growing up and professional standpoint, our ways to describe flavor would vary, right? So the situation even become, I think, more complex when you're trying to bring together and facilitate a communication between internal and external cross-functional team who might have very different objective when you're working on the same project. So I think you might have a better insight for that, Robert. <laughs> well, yeah, it's something you talk about language because some languages, Chinese specifically, which has characters that can illustrate a concept within a letter or a word. Uh, we don't have that in the English language. But for the last 15 years as a consultant, I, I think I've had a unique uh, perspective, right? Being on both sides of the proverbial fence in R&D, sales, um, and working with different companies. Uh, with the customers and the final consumer, I've, I've witnessed a lot of different inefficiencies, inaccurate, misguided. Um, and so when we're not aligned, uh, I, I think that's really is the challenge. So today let's get into how we can get aligned and how we can apply it in our business. Now, some of you may have seen this before. I've used something similar to this in some presentations, but we're each, each unique human beings with a different reality Right. So today we want to focus more, though, on the actual application R&D, who you are as a professional. So the way that we look at that are uh, personas. Right. Um, when was the last time that any of you were doing a food and beverage, uh, whether it be a consumer product good or a menu item, cutting, tasting? And yes, online counts. Right. 
actually today, I think the discussion is more important than ever due to the distance. Um, we've lost a, a level of body language, right? When we used to be together, it wasn't just seeing their face. You could tell what they were thinking of posture and all that. So for, for the flavor evaluation in the R&D process, our professional role actually is a big influencing factor. And I think that's important for each of us to consider the different business cases. Some of us are looking at application. Some of us are looking at just the overall flavor experience. Some are looking at availability, cost, but we can all speak the same language. And that begins with standards. Well, what, speaking of standard, there are definitely some well-structured standards out there. So one exa example is American Society for Testing and Material Standards for small group tasting. I, I'm sure some of you have seen it in Robert's presentation before. So it's actually authored by Laurie Rothman. Um, I don't think she's here today, a fellow RCA member. So if you're interested, you could look up the file on Pathable. But our objective today is to showcase a way to synthesize these standards and combining with technology tools to democratize the process, improve the quality of flavor evaluations, and also create a more easy sharing format. So Robert, let's go straight into the fermented bean paste, the subject of focus of today. Yeah, okay, check this out, folks. Um, just look at these, how different each texture and color is. Now, these are all soybean paste and actually, all of them, but one in the top middle is the Donjang is from, they're all Chinese except for one is from Korea. So last year, we really began to dive deep into the culture, craftsmanship, manufacturing and application of all these different fermented pastes. Um, on the Pathable platform as well, uh, I've posted a video that we produced and um, I think Mr. McAdams is on here. Uh, Christopher, welcome. And uh, it's a video that his wife actually produced for us that, um, that she put together and uh, published. So you can watch that. But many of you on the call today were actually part of this research. And uh, we sent out, what goodness, 100 samples across the nation and people were tasting and capturing media and sharing your thoughts on the platform. So we got a tremendous, I mean, an incredible amount of insights uh, that's informed a lot of our presentation today. So thank you for those of you that participated in the research and for others that wanna participate, me, you know, uh, DM me, send me a message, email me, we'd love to have you included. But let's get into the, the actual work. Now, it's the RCA plus. We all have a role in this complex R&D process. So let's get on the same page. And the way that we begin to organize and codify all flavor evaluations into these three groups. And if you think about it, there's added value at each stage for manufacturers, for retailers, and for food service, regardless if you're the seller, the buyer, or the consumer, we're adding value or we're putting value and paying for value as it moves down the line, right? Um, so it's a complex flavor equation. So let's use fermented soybeans as an example. If I'm looking at that as an ingredient, right? The functionality changes as it goes, right? As it moves down the line. So we use fermented beans. You're looking at some pretty straightforward things. And then as you move forward to the next step into the component, well, let's say it's made into pijan dobanjan, which is a fermented chili bean paste. So when you go from an ingredient, which is more about pricing and sourcing and things like that, when you move into the component, well, now functionality is considered, right? And this is where you start looking contextually what's important depending on the use case, dependent on the consumer, depending on who you are as an internal business role. So bean paste ingredient, tobanjan is a component. Now, arguably, you could say tobanjan is an ingredient if I'm putting it into something, absolutely. But when you get to build, that's an entire complex flavor equation that's different. Let me show you a one minute video of some research while people were here in the US tasting. We had a bunch of people going around China and here's a quick clip. Now you'll see it's transcribed and translated. Thank you, Karina. And on the bottom, make sure you read, not just listen. It's a one minute video. 
，这叫短一些。这个实际上它发酵的时间叫短一些，这个对，对，这个发酵的时间叫长一些。这个颜色要深一点，它的酱香味啊就要越浓一些啊。但因为不同的川菜，它是否用不同的皮香豆瓣来做菜啊？包括我们的麻婆豆腐，包括我们的宫保鸡丁哈、啊，其实。呃，不是宫保鸡丁，麻婆豆腐回锅肉。麻婆豆腐一般要用四年的郫县豆瓣，而我们的回锅肉要用三年的郫县豆瓣来做。So, yes, I personally feel we're responsible to go to the source, right, and get the origin stories first before we apply these ingredients in today's product development. So, if you look at this video, this was taken in China's Sichuan province. In Chengdu City, in Pijian area, and they have national standards for the type of sauce that's made there, right? And so that part of it, that was the component. And then when we move into how it gets used as an ingredient, mapo tofu, something many of you may, may have had before. So now that we get into a build, we add the component. It's a much more complex flavor equation that requires a richer data set to understand it. And think about it: mapo tofu is simple, tofu with a sauce. But still, the color of the paste, noticed he said, indicates how it's used, how long it's been fermented, the texture of it, and that's just in mapo tofu. Imagine a noodle bowl: noodles, broth, vegetable, protein, garnish. Textures, temperatures. How do you describe that to each other in a tasting or a cutting? Well, we're going to help、uh, decipher that today. So, how do you do that? And, folks, you can put some notes in the chat if if something comes up,、uh, please. So, here, what I wanted to bring up is the presentation was billed as a lexicon, but it's actually more than that. I mean, there's established lexicons for what wine, coffee. Chocolate with flavor wheels and all of that. However, I don't think that's enough. I think the contextual relationships is what's important, and that's what an ontology is. When you layer on the relationships, it put things in context of your personal culture, your preferences, and your professional persona. So,、um, in this context, the words that we use, the associated meanings, and the relationships. Is everything of what a flavor 360, you know, what an experience is. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here is is an ontology. It's a global standard used by academia and by the technology industry. It's a well-established discipline. And when you look at the components of an ontology, you have the words in the boxes, you have the relationships that are shown here with line connectors. But notice. It includes modifiers that begin to contextualize the subject matter, and then there's even definitions. So it's not just words and descriptions; it's how they relate to each other. Now, how many of you on the call have searched on Google in the last week or any other browser? This is what makes it possible. Now, think about it for a second. Any language, anywhere in the world, you can search for things in the English language. Without ontologies. We couldn't communicate and have this interoperability. You do it yourself every day, and let me explain what I mean by that. So here's one example:、um, go from left to right. Through this methodology, you can break down the structures, right? You can break down the layers, the building blocks, and the elements of flavor. So this includes, as you can see, not just the sensory attributes, but also who the person is, their genotype. The demographic, where they are and how they act, and also the environmental influences. Now, as I said, we already do this in our minds, but it wasn't until I went up to UC Davis a few years ago, exploring, do my graduate work, and I learned about ontology. Honestly, never heard the word. But for a lot of you on the call, we've been doing this work together for a long time. I didn't realize my ontological journey. Started 20 years ago when I was teaching at the culinary, and I had to teach about the cuisines of Asia, and I needed ways to figure out how to transfer knowledge to students, and it was all about cultural context, right? So then, if you see what I learned is, I met these folks up at UC Davis. I'm like, oh, 
I see there's a way to, to really codify this. So we work together, and this paper is also on the Pathable platform, to publish this paper on, this is the Robert Mondavi Institute. We saw this overlap and how do you break down a recipe? But today we're not breaking down a recipe, we're looking at flavor, but that's kind of what an ontology is. And really folks, I said you all do this. This information on the right is a synthesis of that diagram on the left. However, more useful, which is what we wanna to do today, is it was translated in a sense, interpreted into the, or, into the different senses. What I would do with this on the right to, to update it, I think it's wonderful, it makes sense when you look at it, it's easy to understand. However, the way that we organize it is we look at, first I see the food, second I smell it, third I taste it, then I feel it, and sometimes I even hear it, especially with something like snacks. So this is where we're at. That's the theory, I guess you can say. Um, I'd like to move into the nuts and bolts and how we do it, Karina. All right, thank you, Robert, for setting up the theoretical background for everybody. So now let me go into um, how a, lex a set of lexicons is actually built, right? So very similar to the concept of building a dictionary, right? So the process start off with crowdsourcing all the descriptors and all the definition out there, you know, whether from experts or from your team member or target audience, depending on your objective of the, of the test, right? And then the funneling approach is applied, which means we distill all the information where similar, similar or redundant terms could be removed or merged together until we reach a final consensus. It's very important to note one thing here. You see this workflow, right? It looks a little bit linear, but actually it's not a linear process, but rather a multi-layer distillation exercise. Also, one thing I would like to highlight from the beginning itself, respondents' persona, including their sensory experience, their cultural and professional background is an indispensable filter that we need to consider. And then moving to a more practical approach here, this is how we realize the theoretical framework into a more practical format. Well, we definitely need technology to help with that. So using the right tool is very essential, especially now when more and more remote tastings are likely to happen. So we have developed this four step approach as our guiding principle, which includes the designing of the survey according to your objective to capture all the descriptors, definition, supplementary nuances using multimedia. And then as mentioned earlier, crowdsourcing is not a one-way process. So the right tools should allow us to maintain this feedback loop, right? With follow-up questions with the respondents. So as you start peeling off this meaning layer by layer. Lastly, the last stage, thematic groupings and coherent visual representation will be established. We'll, we'll get more to that later, right? So let's get straight into stage one of crowdsourcing, what we call a frame of reference. So a good survey design is critical at this early stage. So first and foremostly, I think understanding the background of your respondents is always a good first step. So have they tasted the product before? Have they actually worked with it before? So this would give you a lot of insights at the later stage when you're doing the analysis. So, Again, it doesn't need to cover everything, right? Sometimes only a certain parameters are important or relevant, you know, to a particular product or the stage of the product development process. So you might want to just focus on the color, the texture, or certain taste aspect. So as fermented bean paste, what we learn is that fermented bean paste is commonly used as an ingredient, not a final product, right? So that's why we need to guide the respondents using what we call a product-based instruction to perform some sort of sample preparation in a scientific term is basically a process to dilute the sauce to the correct ratio so that the user can taste or else it will be too intense to even taste and evaluate the sauce itself. So lastly, as we always say, right, a picture is worth a thousand words. So there's no reason we don't leverage multimedia as a reference point to break some of this communication and language barriers we discussed earlier, correct? And here we come to this um, a little bit 
uh, a peek into the data set itself. So once all the data come back, you might still find some gray areas like I don't know exactly what they talk about. For example, with descriptors that cover large spectrums of flavor, it's important to always dive deeper. Right. It could only be achieved if you have the, the right tool to build this tree logic or conditional logic to prompt the users and unfold these different layers of information. For instance, in our case study, we find out a lot of users were saying fruity. It comes up again and again. But what type of fruit? What flavors are they talking about here? A mango could taste very different to a cherry or an orange. So as we unravel these different subgroups, we get to the final reference point, which is ultimately a type of food or product that demonstrate a particular flavor explicitly. So it's also one of the most important layers in the lexicon structure. So in relate to the first slide, this is what we, um, what we are trying to apply this cultural filter here. Why, why did I say reference is very important? Well, take a look at the description. Well, there's no doubt that it could effectively delineate the flavor attribute explaining what it is. However, there's, there's substantial advantages of using references to provide a quick snapshot of flavors. So for example, if you, you're talking about nut tea flavor, in American context, you might say, oh, it tastes like peanut butter. Or even if you mention a brand, Skippy, alone, it could give a strong flavor and texture identity. But if you're from a different part of the world, from Southeast Asia, like myself, I might say, oh, it tastes like a peanut butter sauce that go together with the spring roll I used to have, right? Or a deep for the steamboat in China, right? So different cultural filters are important here. So as we enter um, the, late, the later stage of the analysis process, thematic approach is definitely an intuitive method to group key descriptors into different level. And there's tons of software out there that could do the job. So the key things we want to highlight here is that we try to make sure that the lexicon being extracted in this um, study is not simply a list of des descriptions, but rather a set of language that relatable to product development and provide some actionable insights in the R&D process. Right? And then after we've gone through, I myself and, and Dan Goro gone through a, a bunch of different texts. And I would say the fun part of this exercise is actually to review more than 300 videos. So Robert, thank you. So Robert actually did most of the heavy lifting here. So I'm not sure if you have experienced something similar like myself. When I was trying to read the text and listening to what people were saying, oftentimes I don't find them an exact match, right? So Robert, you can jump in right here to, to share how you battle through tons of videos. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what was interesting is first reading what everyone said, I thought, I really thought I understood the participants, flavor evaluations and preferences. Uh, Karina, thank you. And Dan Goro of Lee Kim Key was a partner on this with us. And they went through and did this primary distillation. Thank you. However, similar to white paper concepts being used to determine purchase intent, Really? I mean, words are not enough. So I had this epiphany of after watching the videos and extracting those flavor attributes, watching all of those videos and listening. I mean, truly listening. It's an interpretive process, right? That requires, that requires thinking. And um, I actually manually extracted as I listened. And it wasn't high tech, right? Not yet. So I had Microsoft Word on one side, I had the videos on the other in here, and I went through one by one and, and watched and watched. Some of them were 20 seconds, we were nice and short. Um, some were three minutes. Um, in the top left, I wanna uh, shout out to Chase Obenchain, uh, who's working with us at Flavor360. He had the most articulate flavor description I ever heard. Hadley, I don't know if you're on here, you had some really great stories. There was some fantastic insights. But what I did is listen. Then I had on the paper physical properties, aroma, taste, resulting flavor complexes. And so as I listened and I heard said, oh, that's interesting. They said this. Oh, they said that. So I'm pulling them out. I'm typing them. I'm pausing. I'm going over and over and over. But also something that I found, which we have found very useful in the R&D process, is um, application ideas. 
What did this group of 75 people across the country in all different roles say of how they would use this, how they have used the sauces? And the third, the last part was quotes. Like hearing what people say about it, it really shows what they're thinking. So um, yeah, it was pretty incredible watching and listening and the deeper meanings, the context came to life. Fortunately, there's a better way of doing this. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're working on it. Um, now, I mean, Zoom, Zoom works. It translates your things. Um, YouTube will even do that if you load your videos. Now, the past couple months, our path was effective, as you'll see today, um, and we're going to share the results. However, now that we've learned to do it manually, just like when I learned to cook, I want a basic stove and a, and a pan. I don't want a combi oven yet. But now what we're starting to do is now the videos that we capture, we can transcribe, right? Then we can translate it into languages. Then we can export it onto text. Then we can tag it and annotate it, which is what's being illustrated at the top. Thanks, Chase, for loaning, loaning us your face here. But I found that mushroom kept coming up. So if I have 75 videos transcribed, I want to see how many times people said mushroom. And when they said mushroom, and that's a really important point, I can click on mushroom and watch the person telling me about it because what they said is not what they wrote. So um, yeah, AI is not going to solve what your human thinks. Not yet. Helpful, but it's not everything. So let's get into the fermented sauces themselves because we had some revelations, I would say, emerge from this interactive national tasting. So take a close look at these same sauces from the beginning. Are they sauces or are they pastes? Now think about that for a second. Look around, sauce or paste, sauce or paste. Does it matter? Well, actually, yes. If you call it a sauce or a paste and you want to meet the expectation in a B2B relationship of your customer, you, you better know. If you want to know what the consumer's expectations are, the customer for B2C, you also need to know. So what we want to do is we want to do a, uh, well, Karina, first one thing, tell us a little bit about rheology because it's about the texture part of it. Well, well I, I agree with you because rheology and texture is actually closely related to the identity of the product, especially in the sauce and paste space, right? So I'm sure like there's, there's no lack of scientific tool available in your in your R and D lab or manufacturing facility, which are essential for doing scale up or quality control, right? To test all these different uh, attributes in terms of texture and rheology. But if our focus here is just to replicate the texture that you see, right? You may find that combining your chef senses, we have, I'm sure that we have a lot of experts here. And with a good phone, you could produce almost as good as the result that a viscometer could produce at that stage of product development. So while we're on this same topic, I think it's, it's good to join us for a small exercise. So Robert, are you ready to bring yeah, it up? Absolutely. So let's do this, folks. Um, please go to open up your Pathable platform. I think you're all used to it at this point. And you're going to see there is a poll there. There's two of them. Uh, we'd like you to go through the first room and move this over. I don't know if you can see that regardless. Uh, what I'd like you to do is go to the poll, click on that, and then photo A, photo B, photo C, saucer paste, saucer paste. Please take a moment to do that. Just choose. Is it a sauce? Is it a paste? So do that first. Let's take a minute. And Aaron, if you can see in the background, I don't see it live for me. Oh, actually, I guess if I vote myself. Yeah, I'll you can actually, won't. if you hit the manage tab there, Robert, um, yeah, they'll, yes. they'll, they're Thank actually pulling up um, the grids for you as the speaker, so. You're awesome. Thank you. People are responding. There we go. All I see is speaker only. What is that? Let's see. Wow. Well. Um, I can say 100% of people so far on photo A have voted sauce. Yes. Do you want me to go through the others? Yeah, why not? Okay. Photo B, we have 100% of people have selected paste. And photo C, 100% of people selected paste. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's do this again. 
You know me, folks. It's got to have a video if it's a Dan High presentation. Take a look at this. Sorry, it's not smooth. I don't know why it's jittery, but take a look at these. Watch for a moment. Same thing. Saucer paste. Now that you can see it, once you get a few in there, we can we can show those results, and then we'll move on. Now, as you do that, this was this was the big reveal to me. Regardless of what you said, what the well, actually first, let's hear, let's hear what they said, and then I'll explain. What do we got, Eric? Okay, so photo or video A, we have one hundred percent have chosen sauce. Video B, one hundred percent chose uh, sauce, and photo or video C rather is one hundred percent paste. So, so you're telling me that it completely flipped once people saw the video for, B. Uh, for, for video B, correct. I didn't think it would be hundred percent, but think about that folks. And this is why it's important. What I discovered listening and reading is sodium expectations. This is, I couldn't believe this sodium expectations for paste are different than sauce. Very different for the tasters that said, oh, this is too salty they identified it as a sauce for people that said didn't say anything they thought it was more of an ingredient right that was used inside or part of a bill so going back to those different things how you evaluate them makes a huge difference actually robert sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but um it looks like some folks were having some issues with voting but it's now actually gone to a 55 45 split with sauce to paste so <laughs> That's what I thought was going to happen. Yes. So that makes more sense. So notice how a lot of you changed your mind when you got to see how it looks. It, uh, yes, Boswick, all these different things work, but sometimes we're just talking about flavor and talking to each other. I'm not saying that machinery, that equipment isn't necessary for food manufacturing. Of course it is. But when we're talking outside of the sensory science role, I think videos sometimes are better. So. Uh, this is a flavor wheel. The first one I actually developed, uh, did it with Lee Kim Key, right? One of my longtime partners. And uh, if you look at clockwise, this is the, this is, we did this goodness a year plus ago. It starts with visual, then it goes into physical, then it goes into aroma, primary taste, and then up to flavor complexes or complex flavors. So this was the first one that we did. You go clockwise. Now this is, now let's just show you what we learned, because I completely changed my way of going about this. So first, the senses that we have, right? And Aaron, let me know if there's any questions along the way. I'm willing to kind of pause as we go through this. So for the sure, senses yeah. is in the middle. And in this case, sound was not relevant because it was a, a paste or a sauce in that way. The second level moving into it is the attribute. The attribute of that, the third level, diving a little deeper, is the descriptor. The, four, the next level is the reference, intensity, tone, or shade. And you can see in the top right in visual appearance, this is a really easy example, visual, color, yellow, golden. It just guides you to go through that. But what if, now notice that arrow changed to lactic, because if it's sour, uh, there's not a tone of sour. Maybe there is. Maybe there's intensity levels. There's a lot of things. But a reference might be, oh, it's sour, kind of like lactic acid. Big difference, right? So that's how we organize this new one. And this is a work in progress. Frankly, there's so many things on here I want to change already. But we're in the middle of this research right now. And it's, it's the RCA. So who can we share it with but you? Uh, Karina. All right. So one things um, that one learning that I get out of this is that most flavor wheels are used to provide sensory identity for a product or type of product. But from a marketing point of view, we could also use the same tool to leverage the flavor wheel to gain some consumer insights. So imagine if you could have different, you know, color coding to represent the degree of liking. And the size of the wedges actually change according to the, the intensity level rating 
from your customers. You could quickly identify what are the desirable attributes, the area of improvement, or even extract some actionable next steps from the wheel itself. So another highlight I would like to use here is the visual analog or emoji. So we discussed a little bit about the boundary of language and communication. So when you look at an emoji, happy is happy face, right? So it's easy to associate emotional response to the product using this type of scale. So Robert, what do you think about this idea? Well, I, I, I like it. And what I wanna do next, my dream is to build on, on, on the app and the keyboard, I wanna have an emoji-based flavor evaluation system, right? And tagging, a pig is a pig. You don't need a word for that. Everyone looks at a pig and knows what it is. So I think emojis actually, um, we're gonna start doing that. So now next, I saw this, you can tell it's just a photo I snapped. Uh, I saw this at a local roastery, coffee roastery, and I really liked a few things of this. I thought were smart. One is um, they've got on the left kind of like body, light, medium to guide people of intensity levels or descriptives, adjectives in the bottom right. But one of the big takeaways for me is on the right was the false or the negative attributes and how they isolated that. To me, that was really important. Also, what's exciting, and notice how they, someone typed this and cut them out and pasted them together. Like literally, the original was made by hand, which is pretty freaking impressive. But when I look at this, what I wanna do next is we've been showing you a way to identify and use as a reference. But imagine if, as you're doing the tasting, that it creates a flavor wheel based on everyone's feedback. And that flavor wheel, the more intense it is, the wider it comes out, things like that. Um, don't know, as I said, we're figuring it out. But what we did change in the flavor wheel, then the first one is I extracted flavor complexes. It's not complex flavor, what I used to call it, but it's a flavor complex, meaning it's a combination of a lot of things. These descriptors, these words, may actually end up in the outer ring of the, of the wheel itself, right? Not far-fetched, but in this case, we separate them to the side so people would say, oh yeah, it's like, you know, it's kind of like mushroomy. Oh, I get it, right? Well, what type of mushroom and what have you, right? And so uh, that's one thing that I think is important separate. And then next one, Karina. Yes, so I agree with you, Robert. It's always good to learn from both the good and the bad. Right. And negative attribute is actually another key nuance that goes hand in hand with the lexicon building process. So especially when we're working with fermented product, right? An undesirable characteristic to one culture might be a complete opposite to the other. So for example, for myself, as a Vietnamese Chinese growing up cooking a lot with fermented products, I would much prefer the flavor to be harsh and even stinky. Right. So Robert would gladly tell you more about it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's there's a thing in Vietnam called mom. Mom oh. is a fermented fish from the Mekong. Perfect. They dip in sugar and they ferment it, and it's it's gnarly. I don't know a better word for it. And I, I, you know, I'm squatting the streets of Vietnam trying to eat this, and I'm still like, yeah, I get it. I just can't get into <laughs> not it. Not quite. <laughs> no, after 20 years, I'm still not quite there. So here, as a result, right, we have these. This is kind of where we're at as of today. We've got a few other things to come as we wrap this up. Someone mentioned about the liking, disliking, and yes, I think what you want to do is, you, you just nailed it, Adam and Samir. You're talking about how, look in the chat, how you look at the rating, then you compare it with the jar scale. And again, we need to think. Right, And in the future, we'll be able to do this automatically. Now, where are we going next? Right, That's the present. That's where we've got to uh, so much more. So this is what we're working on now. We're just bringing this to life where imagine you could click on it. It would give you the definition. It would click on it, dive deeper into that element, dive deeper into that element. So what I'm excited about is this is now this is happening, right? This isn't, um, this isn't the future. So this is what we're doing next to try to get it to a somewhat automated, uh, but there are, there are limitations and candidly, you still have to clean up the data before you start loading things. That's just life. So imagine, think about it. Imagine if the words, the language, the context could change 
dependent on who you are, where you are, why you're there, the GPS of the device, what business unit you're in, and no joke, we can well-define product categories that are core to your business, organize them according to persona or to language. And then when someone signs on, you just see what you know, which to me is fascinating to think that we're gonna be there soon. Karina. Well, when you're taking a look at here is that the cultural and language context could be applied here. So imagine if the wheel could change according to the language, translate to the, according to your, um, either your profile or your current location, right? So it would change according to where you are to match with the language that's supposed to be used in the wheel itself. So there will not be any, you know, steps that you need to do to change the wheel itself so the technology is moving towards that direction as well. Yeah, and I mean, you can do this now. It's just a more, more of the configuration and how it does. Yes. So what if, <laughs> to me, cultural overlaps is another thing. So um, imagine this, imagine if I, when I click on dark, right? This is what a dark paste looks like. This is what a golden paste looks like. Why not? Why can't these be interactive experiences that we could use live in our tasting? So like, well, what is that? Now, for years, we've used color swatches, maybe in QA and matching it. And not quite the same, is it? I don't care how accurate the color is, that paste has a lot of levels and textures, mm -hmm. et cetera. So that's color. Then you get to imagine what's shiny. Well, that's shiny. I don't care what language you speak. If I'm looking for something that is coarse, that has whole beans, and these are just actual pictures from just snap from folks. It doesn't need to be fancy. Imagine if I'm doing a rib and I want a sticky, gooey, just mm, just unctuous sauce, like some gojujang fried wings or something. Why not have a video when you're like, okay, what does it look like? Well, it looks like this. It's tacky and this isn't moving smoothly, but you can see it. Just a video communicates so very much. And lastly, I think another, another um, example of that is the cultural context. Now in the wheel, we tried to leave this kind of English-based common vocabulary. Roasted flour can be translated. Mm -hmm. But an example that Karina brought up, I thought was a great one, is Japanese have this kanako. It's a roasted soybean flour. So why not, dependent what culture you're in, when you tap on it, it shows what's relevant to you. Why not, right? Makes complete sense. So um, that is where we are at this point. This is the one tool that we're making interactive. And to me, I think, Karina, one thing to bring up, which is a really, it brings it all back together about this workflow. We just went through this over the next couple of months, but now what we want to do, take the wheel, send, and then have people go through sauces and see if it makes sense. What is it missing? Show us a picture of it. What does this look like to you? Capture it. And then you start crowdsourcing a thousand images and you can start to normalize this. This is what Google's been doing for a long time, but not for us, not for R&D, not for your product lines. So to me, that's how we bring this to life. And we've got excellent. We have a few minutes left for a discussion. And so I would like to, uh, let's open it up and we can look at these. Um, we can look at what's here. Yeah. Okay, Hank, you're in next time. And there you found the pool. Fantastic. Okay. So questions. Let's, uh, let's open this up to, um, should I go to Pathable or should I go to, uh, to Zoom? It looks like we have stuff on both of them. Is that correct? Yeah, most people are chatting within the Zoom chat here, but I can feed anything to you from Pathful here. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's see. We appreciate the like and we got that. Okay, that's good. What other, what questions? I don't see questions we haven't addressed yet, frankly. Are you looking to the chat, Robert? Yeah. Well, let's, well, open, I guess, let's open the, yeah. go ahead, Karina. Would, would you mind if I read the question out loud and then- Please. Yeah, sure. So the first question from Megan, um, are there any data collection platforms you would recommend for developing flavor lexicon as such? <laughs> well, there's a lot. I mean, one, 
Google Forms, that works to gather some stuff, right? Um, even what's it called? Um, Survey Monkey, Flavor 360. It's what we it's what we're building. Um, I think there's a lot of tools out there that you can use to gather this content. The challenge is just like how many people open up your phone, look at the photos. How many photos do you have in your album? I personally have 61,000. I don't know how that happened over the years. Uh, if they're not organized, if they're not coded, if they're not tagged, if they're not in a database, it's really hard to find them. So I, whatever you use, whatever tool it is to harvest it, make sure it ends up in a database you can search and sort and filter as opposed to just having a filing system. So I think that's really important. Um, yeah. Karina, other questions? Yes. So um, one question from Adam for Harvey. I appreciate the lens of liking and disliking, but is that the best way to tell whether or not the goals of the product were met, especially early on this process? Example, something might be too salty for you, but for me, it might be not salty enough. If the goal was a four on a scale of one to 10 for salt, does the liking preference help? Interesting. What do you think, Rena? Well, I, I think it depends on um, if we are referring to um, this particular tasting internal exercise or an external to gain consumer insight, right? So for, for us, what we find is that um, depending on the amount of um, respondents you're going to get. So if we're, we're at the early stage of the R&D process, liking might not be important, right? So it's not, I like it, it's, it's, it's good. No, it's, right. it's more of getting to um, a point whereby it's, it matches with some of the expectation that's set out by either from your clients or your, your internal team from some of the previous study that you have done, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a particular anchor you okay. can, you know, set on. And then when you go to the later stage, consumer insights, of course, your consumer is going to lead the big part of it, right? So I don't know, like, if you actually need to, I don't think that two um, final findings are going to be that much of a difference, right? Mm -hmm. So because with your with your expertise in the field itself, you can somewhat tell that it's not it's not going to be too far off, right? Do you agree right. with me, Robert? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think it's cross referencing. It's not one or the other, and also there's no best. Mm -hmm. There's like flavor, right? There's a lot of ways to do this, and I don't know your world that well. Right. Each one of you have a different environment, who your customer is. Somebody mentioned about the crunchiness of inclusions in chocolate. Uh, I'll be one of your sample people for that. I love I eat chocolate every single day. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think the same thing is taste these chocolates. Tell us what you think. Normalize the data. So it's actually just a, a method to go through it. What I want to do, folks, because we have a moment. And I don't see a ton of questions. Um, um, sorry, first, Robert. There's one last one. Yeah, bring it in. So um, from Christopher McAdam, I currently work with a company in Canada and we're preparing chocolate. Often we have issues speaking the same language around crunchiness of inclusions. How can this philosophy technology help create a better way to meet the client expectations? Well, I guess that's what I was saying just now is I think if you have 100 people taste the bar and give you feedback, you'll start to find out what those normal things are. Go ahead. You have a different opinion. I'm not interpreting it right. Go ahead. No, I, I agree with you. It's just I think one piece we one piece of media what, that we haven't really leveraged here is the audio perspective of it. Ah. It's crunchiness usually related to you know the cracks and you know the the internal structure of right. the of the food matrix. Right. So it's good to maybe think about using that as one of the reference point when you're doing this description with crunchiness. Okay. I'd like to, since we have a few more minutes, don't we have five more minutes? I'm gonna show a three minute video to end this up, Karina, let's do it, right? Um, yeah, and thank you to Sadie McAdams. Uh, Christopher, you're somewhere here. So this paste right here, we wanna show you how it's made. Cause I don't know if you realize that soybeans have a double life. And what I mean by that is, you know, so everyone's had, not everyone, you may have had fermented black beans before, do you realize those are sometimes soybeans? And I'm gonna bring this up. Can someone confirm you can see my screen? Yes. Check this out. It's a three minute video. This is 
just real field research that we were doing while people were tasting the food. Did you realize that by fermenting soybeans, you can change not only their taste to create and release active umami compounds, but the process can also transform the bean's color, aroma, texture, and overall flavor profile? Truly, soybeans are the source of hundreds, if not thousands, of indispensable food products and components. The story of fermenting soybeans into flavorful paste is one of transformation. Let's take a look. 豆酱就是把豆子煮熟了以后，蒸、煮、晾、晒、发酵，然后。This protein powerhouse begins the transformation into soybean paste in Shandong, a coastal province in northeastern China, as resident artisans, chefs, and home cooks have been doing for more than six thousand years. It's fascinating to consider that this is the origin of all soybean paste, like Japanese miso or Korean doenjang. Once the dried soybeans are soaked and cooked, they can take two different paths on their flavorful journey. They can become these dark beans after nearly a year of closed fermentation. Yet another fermentation process only takes a few months to turn into this deep brown paste. First. Let's see how the brown soybean paste is made. 看到没有，中间开始已经发酵了，长得这种长毛，然后有红颜色的毛。After these soybeans have fermented for a few months, the soybean paste, sometimes called ground bean sauce, can be mashed and used in simmer dishes. It can also be added directly into countless recipes. Here are a few that rely on this umami building block of flavor. Including stir fries and braised dishes, a different and longer fermentation process yields these dark black soybeans. This dough, for example, it is used for white dough. White dough, and then after we have been cooked, we have been cooked, and then after we have been cooked, we have been cooked, and then after we have been cooked, we have been cooked, and then after we have been cooked, we have been cooked, and then after we have been cooked, we have been cooked, and then after we have been cooked, we have been cooked, and then after we have been cooked, we have been cooked, and then after we have been cooked, 豆粉的工艺，它仅要经过发散过，然后呢，他们那个微生物才能够有力的增成长。这块的话是不一样的，它就不一定非得要在室外，室内也行。The dark color is created by the Maillard reaction. Made into a simple paste or used whole, we found these being used in Chengdu, Sichuan Province, as part of a stir-fried green bean dish in a double-cooked pork. And they're also an important flavor element in the iconic Mapo Tofu red hot dish. Thanks for having a taste of the stories of fermented foods of Asia. We are continuing this research and look forward to sharing more insights soon. So yeah,、um, there's another way of、um, yeah. There we go. Oops, you're gonna see the whole thing. Uh oh.、Um, but seriously. That is just a sample of the same process that we did to find out flavor from people individually. We just sent researchers out there, answer questions, capture these videos, and then we were able to aggregate this real research and learn some stuff. So thank you, everyone. We're honored to be part of the RCA.、Um, we're, we really appreciate you coming here today. And、uh, Karina, any final notes? No, thank you, and we're honored to share. All these insights, and we look forward to sharing more with you. Yeah, and any other questions? We're here for the moment. It's okay. Last moments, you can unmute yourself. We can actually have a conversation. I don't think we're kicked out for a few minutes. That's okay. We can talk just like at the end of the session. Anyone? Anyone? Everyone's bailing to the next session. Christopher McAdams, how are you, sir? Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Sorry about my headphones. I'm in a large room right now, but I really like. I love the idea of being able to translate all of the sensory issues that you have with this into something like that. Like you know, we're literally communicating across borders right now, trying to get these things right, and like so much is lost in just the written text translation. So like the ability to to include those those contextual reactions, I think is. 
Hmm. I got most of that, Chris. Sorry, Jeff. It's hard to hear. It's just cutting in and out a little bit. Um, but it seems like you're agreeing with it and it's richer than the text. But yeah, if you type something else, and that's okay. Hey, Chef, you're trying. And any other comments? Chase, what do you think? You helped inform some of this. I'll put you on the spot. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so I, I popped something in the chat, but uh, I think one of my biggest questions is, you know, do do we see this process expanding past just fermented beans and, and this one particular project to being a, a larger tool and a broader platform to apply to all of R&D? And how do you see that, uh, you know, maybe creating a, a fingerprint of sorts for foods as we go about assessing them? Well, yeah, <laughs> you know me, I'm not, I'm not, um, let's just say I'm ambitious. Yeah, I, I think we're going to help one piece of all of us redefine the way we, we, we capture flavor experiences and share them with each other more efficiently, um, whether part of our platform, part of all sorts of things. To me, this is a group, right? We all, we all need to contribute. So yes, Chase, I think ingredients, components, and builds is a natural way for us to organize our thoughts and communicate through it. And uh, this is just the beginning. To me, this might be what my graduate work is, something in this and no. Fermented foods is one sample. We can do this with anything and you can do it. And if there's anything we can do to help, we'd love to be there. Yeah. Any other, any other comments from the folks that, that hung on? Mr. Heights, how you doing up there from up north? You have any, any, any insights? Well, I, I love the approach, like the couple of slides that you did right at the beginning with the, uh, with the, with the wine wheel, because I'm going to train Somalia as well. Right. So we're very trained into, um, those senses, those smells, those aromas, right. and we developed this lexicon right at the beginning, right? So I found like within the Somali industry, how it really helped streamline us where I kind of see it's just like how this could apply also with this. It's like with the different lexicons of like texture, saltiness, salt, like it, it, it works, right? It's just developing those new words, right? So it's kind of fascinating how, how you've been able to bridge the two and it, it makes sense. Cool. Hey, who have, the folks that are on, we can't see you? Come on, Lauren, Patty, I know you well enough. Show your face. Um, but seriously, are there any, any other comments? I mean, we get to hang out for a second here and, and chit chat. Uh, yeah, we're just getting started, folks. We're just figuring this out in all candor, right? This is, I don't know, Samir, you're usually is, not at a loss for words. Well, actually, I, I really like this. This is really great, Robert. I mean, your, your presentations are always phenomenal. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I see how this could be a great tool teaching. That's one of the things I struggle with with students is that lexicon. How, mm -hmm. you know, that lexicon we've built up over years of tasting and that we've got in our head. How do you, how do you take a student who doesn't know the terminologies and the words to use to describe a food um and i've i've looked for re good resources out there you know a lot of them are geared towards they aren't really geared towards that colonology culinary approach exactly yeah and you know what it's like when we were in the business sometimes we would get feedback from customers yeah or another salesperson would bring back feedback. Well, yeah. they wanted it creamier. So like what type of creamy? Yeah. Well, yeah, what, what type of, what type of creamier? Cream I've texture, gotten... cream flavor, yeah. cream yeah. smell. And that's, and that's why what we did is when we sent out these surveys or whatever, they downloaded it, it's, it's asking the question, everyone asked it. And you can, the cool thing is, with conditional logic that Karina was talking about, you can say, well, creamy, oh, anytime they tap creamy, now it'll ask them the next question. Right. Is it aroma? Is it smell? Or is it this? Mm -hmm. Okay, if it's aroma, is it of fresh dairy, of butter, of... Yeah. Well, Samir, you're, you're at the university. Let's do some of this stuff together, man. Well, I'd love to support you. Yeah, well, yeah, let's, let's connect. Let's, let's yeah. chat. Hank. Jeff, when they ferment these beans for a longer period of time, does any of the protein value go down? Um, I don't know, but I think it actually goes up. I believe the, the 
uh, bioavailability of these proteins as they break down. I know for flavor, but I believe, I don't know this, right? Think, not know. The nutritional um, bioavailability of what you can digest because it pre-digests it, it is certainly better for you or you can, there's more nutrition. I don't know if it's better for you. There's more available nutrition. Does anyone on the call know any more, anything more about that from a, from a nutritional point? I'm just a chef. Well, it's kind of like eating a um, grapefruit and it takes more calories to digest it than you ingest, but just the opposite. <laughs> That's really interesting. I never <laughs> and do you realize that our brains, right? Are only five percent of our weight, but they five to eight percent, but they consume thirty percent of our calories. That's why you're so exhausted and hungry when you're thinking. At least that's what I think. That's my that's my connection. But that's a fact about how much calories your brain consumes, which is fascinating. Thank you. Of course, Mr. Khalil. Anything from from your point of view? You working in the background in the kitchen because you're so busy. He's busy. <laughs> no, not so not so busy yet. There we are. Um, what do you think, Chef? I no, mean, we were talking this type of stuff eight years ago together. So that's a very good question. I could ask the question of our senior um, science person over at Corn about fermentation and its effects on soy, if it actually increases the protein quality of the soy. Um, soy has an almost perfect protein quality as it is. Um, and I agree with, with you about what you say about making it more bioavailable. Um, it's better for renting. And then it, um, I think what for the key thing that fermentation is going to do is, is uh, develop umami yeah. and those savory notes. I can tell you that when corn, uh, the fungi is fermented, the waste stream on the water, the water has, um, has a significant amount of five prime nucleotides in it. Hmm. Um, have you have you isolate do you, do you harvest those so there was it was about a four million dollar business in the uk they were um distilling it down and uh spray drying it or drum drying it and selling it as a, a, an umami flavor in the uk but they exited the business uh, but they might go back into it okay interesting cool Okay, folks. Well, I think we're, we're almost about, apparently we cut off in a few minutes. Thanks for the heads up. Um, and yeah, I don't know if there's no other questions. I'd say let's get back to the rest of the conference. I can't wait to learn from everyone else. There's been so much cool stuff happening. And uh, yeah, it's nice, Patty. I'll see you in a couple of weeks down in Texas. And uh, I'm sure I'll see and talk with some of the rest of you soon. So thank you for taking the time. Thanks for staying to the end. You all win. I should take a, let me get a snapshot of like who, who lasted all the way. Karina, last notes? No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us. Okay, everyone. Karina, go, to, go to sleep, Karina. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Nice job, Robert. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Most Thanks, welcome. Man. Bye. Pleasure. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Yeah, you too. There we go. Okay, thank you, Aaron, appreciate it.